Okay, let's take a look at Unit 6, which is learning. Um, unit 6 is a shorter chapter, but it's a, a higher percentage uh, of the curriculum. Uh, unit 6 is also difficult for some people because of the difference between the types of associative learning, um, the difference between classical conditioning and operant conditioning, um, and the schedules of reinforcement. Uh, I think the reason why this is so confusing is, is to some people is because of the, the acronyms that are involved in the learning process. So to start out, we have to look at the work of Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was a Russian scientist who was studying automatic responses in animals. Uh, his, obviously his experiment was famous in, in what he was testing. He wanted to see if he could um, associate a sound or something unrelated or previously neutral uh, with a natural response uh, like salivating to the smell of meat powder. So what came from this study was the idea of classical conditioning. Um, and so Pavlov would be your, your traditional example of classical conditioning. An unconditioned response comes from something that's an unconditioned stimulus, and that's just genetic, and it's built into um, our DNA as animals, that, that if an animal is hungry and he smells meat, he's going to salivate. What he wanted to study, what Pavlov wanted to study was if you take an unconditioned response, can you condition it? Can you train uh, an animal uh, to do something that is instinctive without even realizing, uh, meaning that it was accidental? So you take an unconditioned uh, stimulus uh, and you pair it with something that is neutral. Uh, and if you pair it enough times, then the, the word you're looking for is, is anticipation. The animal will begin to anticipate uh, and they will get a response from something that was previously neutral or completely unrelated uh, to their genetic instincts. So when you look at associative learning, this is the unintentional or accidental um, association of two unrelated things. It is not motivated by cause and effect or by rewards. It is automatic, more automatic. Um, to the pairing of two things that, that really don't have any natural uh, or genetic explanation for one another. They just become associated together so that you begin to anticipate an outcome. Uh, again, it's, it's a trained behavior. So unconditioned, anytime you see U.S. Uh, or you are, the, the U is for unconditioned, meaning that it's unlearned. It is a part of your genetic instinctive makeup. Conditioned obviously would then mean learned, something that was built with experience uh, over time, pairing two things together. The response obviously is the reaction, so when you break down the letters, it makes it a little bit easier that way to see that if there's a U, it's going to be something that's unlearned. If there is a uh, C, it's going to be conditioned, which means that it's learned. If it's a response, it's going to be the result or the reaction, and then the S, of course, is going to be the stimulus, whatever causes it. And think of that in literal, literal terms, it stimulates a response. So in the case of Pavlov's experiment, it's going to be the tuning fork that stimulates the response of salivating. So we look at the horrendous example that came from the textbook. You have something like a romantic encounter, like a kiss that should elicit an unconditioned response of, of romantic arousal. But when you pair something that's completely unrelated and does not naturally cause a romantic arousal, but you pair that with the person that you're romantically involved with, if those two things get associated together, then one, the onion, may become conditioned uh, to elicit a response all by itself. So it, it's, it's similar to a smell. If, if there's a smell of a perfume or a cologne that someone wears and you smell it, um, on your significant other, then you would begin to associate that smell just by itself uh, and make you think of that other person and it would elicit a response all by itself. Um, a scent of cologne or perfume, even if it smells good and you enjoy it, should not make you think of a person unless it's paired with another person and you think about that person every time. So enter John Watson. John Watson is a very commonly confused or mistaken name on a lot of our previous tests. Uh, Watson is the American version of Pavlov. What uh, Watson wanted to do was he wanted to test Pavlov's theory, basically replicate his work uh, by using humans. 
And Pavlov uh, w was not really so much trying to find something psychological, but Watson was. In fact, Watson was doing his research as a, um, a response to Freud at the, at the big, kind of turn of the century, the early 1900s, 19-teens, and the 1920s. And Watson basically uh, wanted to offer an alternative to Freud's subconscious theory. Watson believed that we're not motivated by subconscious forces, that we're motivated, um, in fact, by uh, past experience, things that we've trained. And so Watson came up with this whole subfield of psychology that he called behaviorism. It's the study of how behaviors are learned. Now, behaviorism focuses exclusively on human behaviors. Uh, as being trained or learned. It doesn't really delve into the unconscious. It doesn't really delve into emotions. It doesn't really delve into instinctive drives. And so in that way, it, it's not a complete explanation. But what it is, is it's a, an explanation of why humans behave the way they do. Uh, so that was the only thing that Watson was interested in. It wasn't that behaviors believe that you don't have emotional responses. They just didn't want to study them. They wanted to see human behaviors. Um, and so Behaviorism kind of began as Watson's attempt to condition human beings, which obviously has its ethical challenges. And, and of course, we know that he picked little baby Albert uh, as his test subject. And the reason why that's significant is, is Watson chose a baby because he needed a neutral human, quote unquote, one that didn't already have training or experience. So he wanted to take the most neutral human that could not make uh, cognitive judgments um, that would ruin his studies. He wanted to pick a child that should not naturally have a fear of something uh, instinctively, and he wanted to condition that fear into them, which he did with furry objects and, and bunnies and dogs and even a little monkey. Uh, and of course, there are all kinds of flaws with this. We know uh, from analyzing research methods that um, there's not just ethical flaws here, there's also design flaws, because obviously his his findings and conclusions cannot be replicated for older uh, people. So basically, as soon as you become of a cognitive age to, to make your own decisions and, and, and have knowledge, then that fear is no longer conditioned. But in, in Watson's defense, it wouldn't be a fear of bunnies or, or, or animals per se, but how older humans would be conditioned um, would be a fear of, say, cars after having a car, a car accident or something like that. So when you look at post-traumatic stress, Watson actually is probably a little bit uh, more spot on than he's giving credit for, that humans do learn fears, uh, that fears are associated with experiences, they're not rational, and they're not voluntary, and that they are automatic. So acquiring and maintaining these behaviors is a process of acquisition and maintenance. So maintenance would be obviously something that you continue. So the acquisition is, is a vocab term for the initial learning. You acquire a fear. Uh, of, of cars. You acquire a fear of, of furry animals if you're baby Albert. So acquisition is the initial learning. Extin extinction would be the obvious elimination of that fear. And just like you can acquire a fear, you can extinct the fear. So if you went to, say, a cognitive behavioral psychologist to get rid of your phobia, what they would do is they would teach you how to extinct that fear. And they would use techniques um, like systematic desensitization and over time, you would have an experience with something, say heights. If you had a fear of heights and you wanted to eliminate your fear of heights, then um, over time, they would pair uh, positive experiences with uh, high altitudes and, and hopefully in an attempt to extinct your fear. So if you, if you get the stimulus without the response enough times, you're, you're going to have the opposite of acquisition, which is to extinct the fear. So... Uh, extinction is to stop a response when no longer paired with a stimulus and it's no longer reinforced. Uh, you also see extinction happen with, with, with behavioral learning, like behavioral learning techniques. If, if uh, a teacher gives you a referral every time you say a curse word or they give you a referral every time uh, you're tardy, that, that's acquiring the knowledge that this behavior will get this punishment. Well, if they stop the punishment and you continue the behavior without the punishment, you no longer associate the behavior with the punishment, which is why in the behavioral approach, it's important to stay consistent, whether you're training your dog or you're training your school-age kids uh, or whatever the case may be. 
Spontaneous recovery, though, is, a, is this phenomena that happens, especially in, in really intense things like fear or trauma, where you can, without warning, and even after a long period of time, suddenly experience that fear again. It just suddenly reappears, or that behavior, uh, but it happens a lot with fears. So, for instance, you might have been in a car accident at a certain intersection, and then you drive at that intersection for a long time, and that fear has been extinct, but for whatever reason, on, on a certain day, several years later, the conditions are right, and, you're, and, and just brings your brain back to that place, and you have a spontaneous recovery of that fear, even after it supposedly had been extinct. So when you look at the still shots from the Baby Albert experiment, you can see Rosalie Rayner uh, and Watson up in the top left corner of the screenshots there. This is from the footage of one of his trials and you can see baby Albert um, and you can see on the right um, with B1, B2, and B3 those images his fear response which is pretty easy uh, to evaluate that he's he's clearly upset um, from the pictures of A to B his demeanor changes a lot. Now in the terms of well, moving past fear into more learning like how little kids learn to associate certain things you have to know the difference between generalization and discrimination. So for instance, generalization would be reacting the same to any simul similar stimuli. So generalizing all trees to the right, they're just trees. So that gets down into Piaget's, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, schema concepts. Discrimination, though, is, is when you have a very specific trained outcome. Uh, the example I gave in class is if your dog will bark when he hears the doorbell from the door, but he doesn't know the difference, but he but he also can discriminate if the doorbell is on TV. He, he knows how to discriminate the difference between those two stimuli. One of those is real and the other one is not. One of those is a sound that he's, he's peaked by, the other one is not. So discrimination will be the opposite of generalization, reacting only to the specific stimuli that you've been conditioned with. You look specifically in this example for the evergreen as a Christmas tree as opposed to just trees in general. Associative learning, again, is just another word for, for, for pairing two things together. So it could be classical conditioning or operant conditioning. But in this case, let's look at um, operant conditioning um, with Thorndike and Skinner. But this was really piloted by B.F. Skinner. So operant conditioning, think the word operate. You're actively choosing to participate in a behavior, knowing that that behavior will be reinforced or punished. So now we're getting into uh, behavior modification techniques and training. So for this, we have to look at a couple of things. The term positive doesn't mean good, it means addition. The word negative doesn't mean bad, it means subtracting or taking away, eliminating something. So when we're talking about operant conditioning, the positive term talks about adding something as a way to either reinforce or to punish. And the term negative means to subtract something as a way to reinforce or to punish. So when you look at the four quadrants of operant conditioning, I like this chart here. It says when training an animal, there is one behavior that we want to reinforce or increase and another behavior that we want to punish or decrease. We can add something good or bad, that's a positive, or we can remove or delay something good or bad, which is negative, to get the behavior that we want. In this example, the reinforced behavior is loose leash walking. The punished behavior is pulling the leash. So positive reinforcement is adding good stuff to increase the behavior. Uh, negative punishment is delaying the good stuff to decrease the behavior, right? Um, the positive reinforcement is adding bad stuff to decrease the behavior, and the negative reinforcement is delaying the bad stuff or eliminating, in, in other cases, to increase the behavior. So the whole idea behind reinforcement, and it's kind of problematic that the, the, the ones on the left are green and the ones on the right are red, because really if you're, if you're trying to prime your brain, you should look at both the, um, the, the, the punishments as red and the reinforcements as, as, as green. So reinforcement is going to continue a behavior. So by removing a stimulus to continue a behavior, that's, that's, a, that's a positive outcome. That's a good outcome. In this case, I should say it's a good outcome. So if we want to eliminate your curfew as a way to reinforce a good behavior, like you made a good choice or you you know did well in school so your parents want to reinforce your good grades by eliminating your curfew that's an example of negative reinforcement they're reinforcing the behavior by removing something so if you just take the term and put it in reverse so for instance positive punishment 
positive sounds good. Well, let's put it backwards. We're punishing by adding something or negative punishment. We're punishing a behavior by subtracting something. And you can do the same thing with reinforcement. So instead of saying negative reinforcement, you can say reinforcing negatively. So we're reinforcing a behavior by removing a stimulus or positive reinforcement. We're reinforcing positively. We're re reinforcing a behavior by adding something. So positive reinforcement would be to give you money because your grades were good. Negative reinforcement would be to eliminate your curfew because your grades were good. Now punishment is a little bit easier. So if we're gonna positively punish a behavior, we're gonna add something that you don't want as a form of punishment. So um, maybe they, what would happen is if, if like I said, they, they yell at you, your parents are, are adding you know, angry, angry tones and words that yelling at you for bad grades would be positive punishment. Negative punishment would be to take away something so they take away your phone because of your bad grades. Um, and that's positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. This all comes from the idea of behavior modification or shaping which is the uh, vocab term. Shaping is, is this gradual progression of the training of animal behaviors. And again, these behaviors are motivated by the desired outcome. The rat may not know um, why they can anticipate that a treat is coming, but they have learned that if they do A, then B will be the result. So it's, it's specifically motivated by the outcome. It's a conscious choice that the rat is making. If I push on this response lever, then food will appear uh, in the dispenser. So this is all from B.F. Skinner or Skinnerian, as it's often known, um, learning, which is operant conditioning. Schedules of reinforcement refer to the the best way to reinforce a behavior in a behavior modification process. So for instance, it can get a bit overwhelming to think of the various schedules of reinforcement. You have fixed ratio schedules of re reinforcement, you have fixed interval schedules of reinforcement, and you have variable ratio schedules of reinforcement and variable interval schedules of reinforcement. And it's really kind of mind numbing to think about uh, the differences and similarities between all of those things. But if you take a second and analyze and really kind of break down the semantic meaning of the words in the phrase, it becomes pretty simple. So for instance, let's, let's, let's talk about what schedules of reinforcement are, and then let's talk about the verbiage behind them. So schedules of reinforcement is a behavior modification term uh, that refers to how often and how many times uh, a reward is offered after a behavior. So for instance, to, to use the dog example, if we're training our dog to shake, we want to reinforce the behavior of shaking. It's not a punishment scenario in this behavior modification process because we're not gonna punish the dog whenever he doesn't shake. We want to reward the dog whenever he does. We want to reinforce a desired behavior. So whenever the dog lifts his paw to shake, we're gonna reinforce that in a positive reinforcement, we're gonna give him a treat. So in order to really solidify the expectation of the reward though, we're gonna to have to use a fixed schedule. The ratio of times is gonna to have to be fixed and the ratio of the interval, the amount of time is gonna be fixed. So when you look at the terms, let's look at the vocab there at the top of the screen. Variable equals unpredictable. Think the word varied. Varied is not predictable, right? It varies. So they never know when the reward is coming. Fixed means it always stays the same. So that would be a, a set predictable amount, a set predictable number of times. Ratio is a time that, that, that refers to, to um, uh, the actual amount of, of reinforcements that are given. So to say it another way, this would be the number of behaviors that it takes to receive the reinforcement, right? So in other words, if you use a fixed ratio, then you would reward the dog every time he shakes or every fourth time he shakes, just often enough to reinforce the behavior, but it has to be predictable. It has to be the same ratio. So four to one, right? If four behaviors to one award is a four to one ratio. So for every four times the dog shakes, he gets one treat. And the same thing is true like with your tardies, right? Every third time you're tardy, 
then you uh, get detention. So that's a fixed ratio uh, of, of, in that case, would be punishment. So fixed and variable refer to whether or not it is predictable, but ratio and interval refer to um, the number of behaviors and the amount of time that has passed. So interval is obviously a time, it's a sequence of time uh, and a term that refers to amount of time that has passed. So anytime you see a unit of time in a question, it's referring to interval. So if it says Tim gave his dog a treat 10 seconds after he shook, it's going to be an interval because it's an amount of time that passed. So that's one trick that you can use to remember the difference is that interval is always going to be a unit of measure of time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, etc. Ratio is going to be a number of behaviors, an actual ratio of behaviors, right? So every, you know, every... Every time I buy nine large coffees, I get one free coffee. That's that is a fixed ratio of reinforcement because there's there's ten coffees, ten coffees purchased to one award. So the ratio is the number of behaviors. The interval is the amount of time. And then you look at that schedules of reinforcement chart at the bottom. A fixed ratio is every so many, right? And it's on a set fixed schedule. Reinforcement after every blank behavior, such as buying ten coffees, getting one free. Right, a variable ratio would be that you don't know; it's unpredictable. After an unpredictable number, uh, and that would be more like a slot machine. Right, there's an unpredictable number of times that I have to pull the slot machine lever in order to to get uh, to hit a jackpot. If a slot machine operated on a fixed ratio, then casinos would not make any money because you would know exactly how many times you had to put money into the machine in order to win. So it has to be variable. It has to be unpredictable because there's that chance. There's there's not the expectation, but there's a chance that it could happen. Now, if no one ever won money in a slot machine in any casino, then people would stop putting money into a slot machine. So even a variable ratio can have some somewhat... Um, desirable effects because if you're a casino owner and you have slot machines people win often enough even though it's unpredictable that they can actually expect that they might possibly hit a jackpot if no one ever won then you would have no reinforcement and it obviously the behavior would not be reinforced so there has to be, even if it's unpredictable there has to be a reward or a reinforcement at some point to continue the behavior Right, so I like the slot machine example. If no one ever won money in slot machines, people would stop spending their money on slot machines. So eventually, they have to pay out. It can be an unpredictable number of times, but they have to pay out at some point so that people have some kind of expectation, even if it's unpredictable when it will happen, that it could potentially happen. Now, when you're training a dog, you don't want that. You don't want a variable uh, ratio because the dog doesn't know if he's going to be uh, reinforced for, sh for shaking this time or not, which is not going to strengthen the behavior. You want to reinforce them, uh, you know, every third time or every fourth time. And maybe at the beginning when you're training them to shake, you want to reinforce them every single time. Uh, and then you can kind of space them out. But you want to keep it fixed and predictable. As far as the intervals are concerned, that also comes into play with behavior modification. So that's the amount of time that passes after the behavior before the reinforcement, right? So again, even if it's a punishment, let's say you commit a crime or you, you let's say a good example would be a, a traffic ticket from um, a photo that they take at an intersection. So you, you blow through a red light at an intersection in Gulf Breeze and then two weeks from now you get a ticket in the mail. Well, that was unpredictable amount of time that has passed from the behavior to the punishment for that behavior. So that would be unpredictable. That would be a variable interval. Right. So every so often, interval is amount of time. The reinforcement for the behavior after a fixed time. So a fixed interval would be, you know, uh, again, it's going to be a unit of time. Every 10 minutes, this timer goes off. Every Tuesday, we have, you know, Taco Tuesday. Whatever the case may be, but it's fixed and it's predictable and it's and it's an amount of time. Uh, variable obviously is going to be the opposite of that. It's unpredictably often reinforcement for the behavior after a random amount of time. So again, slot machines are not an example of variable interval because if you sat at a slot machine, pulled the lever, waited 10 minutes, walked away, and then the jackpot hit, that would be a variable amount of time. So the way that you can distinguish these is the amount of time that passes after the behavior before the reward. So it's usually going to be instantaneous, right? But if it's like a punishment, it may not be. You may, you may, um, 
you know, you may think that uh, you go to school and you're you're out of dress code and, and you don't realize until fifth period that you get called into the dean's office um, that, that you are violating dress code. There's an unpredictable amount of time that has passed from a behavior. So unpredictably often, reinforcement for the behavior after a random amount of time. Again, like you send a text message uh, or Snapchat uh, story, you don't know how long it's going to be before you get a response. It's unpredictable. It's varied. So that's a variable interval. Right? You apply for a job and you don't know how long, how much time is going to pass before they contact you back, right? which causes a lot of stress because it's unpredictable. You don't know. If they tell you, we'll call you on Tuesday, then there's still that anxiety there of, am I going to be hired? But you know exactly when to hear back. Right? A variable interval, I heard explained one time from a professor that if you go on a date with someone and then they don't call you back the next day, it's a variable interval amount of time because you don't know how long it's going to be before you hear from them, right? which can be stressful. So schedules of reinforcement have to do with um, how predictable the reinforcement is after the behavior, right? which is going to determine how strong the behavior is or how weak the behavior is. Motivation, intrinsic versus extrinsic. Um, this is this is a this is a major topic in psychology, and we won't really go into all the details here uh, for the purposes of review. But intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation really deals with um, you know what motivates the the learning of behavior and the acquisition of of behaviors. Because sometimes, like say for instance with Skinner, operant conditioning. If it's extrinsic motivation, the reason for the behavior is because of the outcome. Whereas intrinsic motivation, right? So for instance, you're, the way that you've been trained in school is through behavior modification. Why do you go to class and sit down? Why are you on time? Why do you not get up and leave to go to the bathroom? Why do you not eat in class? Uh, why do you bother to turn your homework in? Well, all those things are tied to external stimuli. If they were not tied to external stimuli, would you do them? Would you be intrinsically motivated internally just to perform the behavior for the sake of doing it? So intrinsic motivation, those are the things that we do with no desired hope of outcome, right? Uh, no desired reward that's going to come. There's no promise. I'm going to go home and, and write or go home and paint or go home and exercise just because that's it. That's what you want to do. That's how you choose to spend your time. That's how you're intrinsically motivated. So you're probably intrinsically motivated, right, to, to, to just mindlessly scroll through Instagram. But you might be extrinsically motivated to watch this review video, uh, for instance, right? But then you get deeper into intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, right? And you start getting into external locus of control and internal locus of control. And it gets really, really deep really quickly as far as like, I don't, I am, I am motivated by outcomes that I think I'm in control of, and therefore I can control my future. And it, it, it becomes, it becomes really philosophical really quickly. So for purposes of review, just think, am I motivated by an outcome, which would be external, which is extrinsic or am I simply just driven right to do this behavior regardless of what the outcome is for instance if I go out um, you know and and I go paint for an hour or you go you know kayaking for an hour there doesn't have to be an outcome for that to be an enjoyable experience that's just something you do because you enjoy the the actual process and not the outcome from the process right we don't do homework because we enjoy doing homework we do homework because of the the outcome now you might read because you enjoy reading it's not about the outcome it's about the process so that's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation Observational learning is the third type of learning. If you look at the three ways that animals can learn anything, they can learn classically, they can learn operantly, or they can learn through observing others, right? And this is a high level skill, as we've talked about, that not all species uh, have the brain power to learn observationally. Um, but this was probably most famously studied with Albert Bandura's Bobo the Clown Doll. So the, the term here, if, if Skinner is shaping of behavior through behavior modification, then Bandura is modeling so how much of our behavior is modeled by other people, right, in our social interactions with our parents or as we get older, right? Modeling is observed and imitating a specific behavior. And that comes from our ability to empathize and to initiate. And that's from mirror neurons in the frontal lobe, at the very back of the frontal lobe, almost in the, in the parietal lobe. We have mirror neurons, and that's what allow us to imitate 
And what is empathy if not imitating, right? I'm not sad because something bad happened to me. I'm sad because I'm observing you being sad. That's empathy. Empathy is I feel the way that you feel because of mirror neurons, right? You watch uh, a horror slasher movie and somebody, you know, is horrendously injured and it, it makes you wince and cringe. Well, that's that's mirror neurons. That's your empathy for someone else. Or you watch like a, um, an injury happen in a sporting event and you have to look away. That's, that's mirror neurons. It's your ability to empathize. Ow, that must be painful for them. So those are mirror neurons in the brain. And what Bandura was studying was how observational learning can impact children. Essentially, will children be more aggressive if the model that they observe is aggressive? And these are things they do without instructions. So when children watch people be aggressive, then they tend to mimic that aggressive behavior. And not only that, if children, even the demeanor of children, if they come into a room and it's calm and quiet, they'll tend to be more calm and quiet. If it's crazy and there's madness and chaos going on, they'll jump right in. So it's the difference between like going into class in kindergarten and going to a birthday party. They observe what's going on and they adapt without even realizing that they're doing it. It's observational um, learning. So that's the Bobo the Clown Doll. And again, that's Bandura. Bandura is a guy that, that studied observational learning, also at Stanford, um, like Zimbardo. Uh, so that would be known as the social cognitive perspective because it is cognitive is that it is the mind. It is mirror neurons in the brain, um, but it also is social because it's the interaction of people with their environment and models, modeled behavior. All right, so that brings us to unit seven. Unit seven, we'll get into cognition and memory. There are a lot of things in unit seven um, that, that people we'll have questions about the different types of memory, uh, the different levels of memory storage and rehearsal, interference and memory recall and things like that. So stay tuned for unit seven.